I wish somebody would be there to whisper in her ear and be like, not this one. Because this is such a poor choice. And the only reason that we get for why she knew he was the one is because that night that they met, they went and hung out in a swimming pool and he held her in the swimming pool. And because he was willing to hold her without seeming like he needed it to go somewhere or pushing her to do more than she wanted to do and just like held her close and helped her to feel protected, then she was like, oh, I'm all in. I'm all in with this one, you know? Can I have your babies? Can we get married? Can I love you for the rest of my life? Hello, how are you? My name is Cheer Denise, welcome to my channel. And today we're on part three of the Britney memoir, The Woman in Me. Now, this book, like I explained in the previous chapter, we are still reading all the chapters. It's just that each chapter is so short, it wouldn't be worth one episode on its own. So I'm grouping together about eight chapters at a time. And so we're on part three. And in this section, we're talking about the fallout from the breakup with Justin the way she's coping in her personal life, um, the real degradation that she is feeling um, about herself, about her self-worth, and also just all the piling on from the media that would make it really hard to believe that you really have value if seemingly nobody else thinks you do either. So if you already have this really loud voice in your head saying, you aren't enough, you should be ashamed of yourself, everyone's disappointed in you, and then you get that reinforcement constantly from everybody else, it'd be very difficult to keep your head up. And she's just gonna make a series of really, really poor choices in this section, um, based always on the need to be seen and to be loved. And because she has no capacity to generate any understanding within herself that she has intrinsic value because she is made in the image of God, because she has no concept that she has worth, because she has no concept that she has talent and that she is extremely, extremely well loved by so many people because she keeps hearing the loud sound of everybody's negativity. She really is gonna struggle in this chapter to gain footing. And the same issues that we saw last chapter of her desperately needing some kind of a mentor, but not having anybody to step into that role in any positive way are really gonna come back to haunt her in this chapter. This is where we meet Kevin Federline. And I have to say that I think that marrying him was the greatest mistake she ever made. And she's made mistakes, um, but I think that the desperation that she felt to be loved and seen created a very low bar that he had to get over and she gave him props for all kinds of things when it's like mm -mm, sister that guy should have been thrown to the curb immediately i mean red flags were waving from start to finish in that relationship but you know the same sort of things are playing out here that played out with justin justin was screaming at her through his actions to leave him and she just kept being like, la, 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 la. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. I won't think about it. I won't think about it. And so she ends up being blindsided with anybody else that was looking on. Could have seen that guy's not serious. Um, and, you know, I, I think that in this section, up until now, part one was just about her childhood. Part two is about the rise of her career, but then, you know, really hitting a rough patch when Justin decided to betray her and make it seem like he had to write an album based on all of the cheating she did, you know, and throws her under the bus and then everybody, you know, piles on. And I feel like I have just felt really empathetic and sad and sorry for her in all, in all of the circumstances. And I still do in this section, but I will say that this is the first time in the book when I'm like, all right, we've got to start taking account of our own actions. We've got to at some point decide, all right, I, have got to take some control of, of what's going on here. And it starts with me being responsible for what I do. Brittany continually falls back on this idea that she's just a little girl. I'm just a little girl, honestly, I didn't know. And the number of times she says that are shocking. In fact, the number of times she uses the word little or tiny to describe herself is innumerable. And I've noticed that all along and haven't mentioned it yet. Um, but I think it's really interesting. I was just a little bitty girl. I was just so tiny, uh, my little soul, um, my tiny little bitty dresses, little bitty old me, honestly, I didn't know. She infantilizes herself constantly. And so if you think of yourself as a little kid all the time, you 
then give yourself an enormous amount of leeway to make a lot of egregious choices and just kind of throw back on, well, I was innocent, I didn't mean it. My motivation wasn't bad. I honestly don't think her motivation is is often bad. I mean, I, I really think that she does have two personalities. I think there's, you know, wild sexualized Britney on stage, and then there's this little Louisiana girl. And I think that she functions 100% in both of those characters when she's playing those characters. But I think that that's part of the reason that she's struggling so much in life is she doesn't know who she is. She's got the crazy character on stage that she hides behind. And then she's got the person in real life that can't stand up to anybody and wants to just be sweet and have everybody like her. Um, and so because she's got a really strong version of, of because she's got a really strong presence on stage, but a really weak presence in real life, she doesn't know how to get through life. So the easiest thing she's found is to just say, well, I didn't know. Like literally, oops, I did it again. It should be like life's theme song for her because there's this insistence on her innocence um, and this insistence that she didn't mean to and people misunderstood her. And I think that there is some, I, I, I think there is a lot of truth to that. I think that she is very naive. I think that she is sort of willfully ignorant about a lot of things. I think that there wasn't a lot of time invested in um, growing herself as a person but sort of hiding from the things that scared her, going towards the things that were the easiest, and then making excuses when things went off the rails. And I, I'm i not judging her harshly. I don't think she had a, I, she definitely did not have a robust team of people around her to help her navigate life. She was like essentially emancipated at 15 because she went off and began working and supporting the family and nobody ever said boo to her again as far as like, hey baby, don't do that. But we're gonna definitely have to grapple with some of the choices that she's making. And I think it would do her and nobody else any favors if we're listening, if we're just like, oh, it's so sad how everybody else treated Britney. That is sad. And I do think there's a lot of people who misused and abused her. But again, I think we have to, in order to respect Britney 100%, we have to hold her to a standard too. And we can't just say, well, you didn't mean to. We have to respect her enough to say, because you are a grown adult, how about why, why was it, why, why was this the path you chose to take? And not in a Diane Sawyer way. When we get to that part of this chapter about that interview that she did, I have so many things to say about that. It was despicable the way Diane Sawyer spoke to her. So I'm not saying um, let's bully and be unkind in our judgment of this section. I'm just saying if we want to respect Brittany, then we would respect her enough to say, okay, tell, I, I really wanna know why this really happened. Not, I didn't know, I didn't mean to, but really, what was the real truth behind the, these decisions? So I kind of want to like play with that idea a little bit, kind of maybe, I don't know, uh, just tug at that idea a little bit more. I would say that in, in all the sections thus far, this is when she is most vague about a lot of things. She's skimming the surface a lot here. And I don't know if it's because she doesn't really know her motivation or because it's too painful to talk about. Um, it's still super interesting. It's not like skimming the surface and that we get nothing, but just, I think that she's, yeah, I think she's either really confused about her motivation or doesn't want to expose her motivation. Anyway, let's get into it because we have quite a few chapters to cover. We've got about eight chapters to cover. Chapter 16 starts off with, Justin ended up sleeping with six or seven girls in the weeks after we officially broke up, or so I heard. Hey, I get it. He was Justin Timberlake. This was his first time to go solo. He was a girl's dream. I was in love with him. I understood the infatuation people had with him. But she said that because she saw him dating, she realized, okay, I got to get out there too. I can't just sit around and watch him run around all over the place. His face was on every magazine. Everyone was talking about him. A song was constantly on the radio. And she felt like she needed, I don't know, maybe to have a rebound relationship. There was a guy she thought was super cute and she had talked to this club promoter about him and the club promoter friend was like, yeah, you've got great taste in men. This guy's awesome. I don't know who this club promoter was, but he's insane because the guy that she was talking about was Colin Farrell. Okay, I mean, I'm not saying that he isn't, you know, I, I could see how a person could be like physically attracted to him, but like a great guy, I don't know if anybody would look to him and be like, that is the future father of my children, you know? Um, I mean, that guy looks like he rides him hard and puts him up wet. He just looks rough. There's just something about him that's like you would look at him, you'd be like, you'd be swept up in some crazy. 
if you got into a relationship with him and Brittany is. So Brittany says that she decided to just put herself out there and just take charge and do like have a bold move here. And so she went ahead and showed up at the set where she knew that he was filming this movie. She marvels at the courage she had to do this. She's like, who did I think I was? Little Britney Spears walking up like, that is so wild to me that I did that. And I'm like, who do you think you are? You are Britney Spears. You can go anywhere you want to and no one's gonna shoo you away. At least at this point in her career, you know? I mean, she could have shown up anywhere. And the director gave her his chair and was like, hey, take a seat, welcome on set. You know, it's like big day for them. Look who just showed up. And Britney doesn't even get it. And I said this in the last episode, she's constantly like blinded by everybody else's star and can't even seem to realize and conceive of the fact that she too is shining just as bright. But she constantly is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that so-and-so just walked in. I get to talk to so-and-so. And I'm like, you realize that half the room is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe Britney Spears just walked in. She doesn't get it. Anyway, she's like flabbergasted, shocked and amazed by her own balls to just show up on this set. And of course, Colin Farrell immediately starts flirting with her. And he comes over and he's like, do you have any pointers for what I should do here? And she's like, believes that he's actually asking her to direct him. She's like, can you believe that? He actually asked me to direct him. And I'm like, no, he's just flirting with you. Uh, he, there's a director on set, you know? Um, but she says that they ended up, in her words, having a two week brawl. And brawl is the only word for it. We were all over each other grappling so passionately. It was like we were in a street fight. Kind of sounds scary. She said in the course of things together, he invited her to go to this premiere with him for the movie, The Recruit, that he was in with Al Pacino. She was so flattered he would ask her. I mean, oh my gosh, Colin Farrell, this absolute nobody of an actor, is asking Britney Spears to go out. But she's over there flabbergasted, amazed and shocked that he would ask her to go with him. I'm like, the poor guy's trying to get a career. Of course he's going to ask you. But again, she degrades herself in this moment because she says that she looks back at pictures of her at that premiere and she says she wore this pajama top. And at the time she thought it was a real shirt because it had these little rhinestone studs on it. But now she looks back on it and she's like, that was definitely a pajama top. But Brittany, I'm like, yeah, but you and everybody else at that time was wearing lingerie out and acting like it was clothes. Like you weren't some outlier in this fashion moment. Literally everyone was wearing slip dresses and little slip shirts and little camisole looking things. I look back on that picture and I'm like, okay, not a great look, but also everybody else looked like trash in the early 2000s. Worst fashion era of all time. So I don't know why she puts herself down like this. And also like later on, I mean, I'm gonna be talking about that Diane Sawyer interview so much, but later on when she talks to Diane Sawyer, Diane Sawyer is like, so, do you have anything to say about why you look so bad all the time? Why your clothes are always so whack? You really seem to struggle to dress yourself. It's the meanest, meanest interview I've ever seen. And she comes with evidence and she's like, what do you have to say about this outfit? What do you have to say about this outfit? And what I say to you, Diane Sawyer, is what do you think about everybody's clothes right now? Nobody looked good, you know? Why are they coming down so hard on Britney? Can we scan over to Christina Aguilera who looks like she takes a bath in gasoline? Yet Brittany is the one that was constantly catching heat for everything. Anyway, I just really hate the fact that she goes to, uh, goes so hard on herself about this pajama top. Like, oh, I'm so stupid for wearing that. Yeah, well, I'm sure everybody else was also in their little pieces of lingerie to try to call it clothes. Okay, well, she said that she tried to, to play it cool in that relationship and tell herself it was just for fun. But in her heart of hearts, she did sort of think maybe it would go somewhere. Maybe, you know, and I think that's sort of the way she approached all relationships. I mean, yeah, let's just have a lot of fun, but like maybe this is the one. Because the reality is she did want to get married. She wanted to get married and have kids. Remember when she was 19 years old and got pregnant with Justin? She definitely didn't look at that as though it was a tragedy, you know? She wasn't scared by that. And so dating for fun is, I don't really think, a concept in, in, her, in her mind. And I don't blame her for that. Like, I, you know, I got married when I was really young. I was 22. And I've never been more grateful for it. I didn't have to run around trying to figure out who Mr. Wright was and like all this dating. I didn't have to like do the, the dating apps and all this. Sounds like a nightmare out there. And so I don't blame her for wanting to get married young and have a family and just create some kind of stability. Because part of me thinks that one of the reasons she wanted a family was because hers was so jacked up and then she'd like immediately entered the world of fame and she'd done all that and, you know, becomes a, a real somebody. What else is there left to do? Uh, create a cozy home 
try it for yourself. Your parents failed, but maybe you can do better. Maybe you can create the life you never had. I think that's what she always wanted, was to create some kind of normalcy. And I said this in the first episode when we talked about how frequently she would go back to Louisiana, even though her star was rising, and kept hoping that that could be home base, that there could be, that there was a possibility that you could be super famous and then go home and it could just be like it always was. Well, that's not possible, but maybe now if she can get married and have kids, maybe that could be normalcy. Well, it definitely wasn't with Colin Farrell, I'll say that much. Now, she talks about how much she struggled with social anxiety and that it had really begin to, begun to mount. And I don't blame her because, you know, there's a lot of people who struggle with social anxiety for a variety of reasons. But Brittany's sense that going into any kind of conversation was going to turn out to be a mortifying experience for her had been solidified enough times that it's not just an anxiety, a baseless anxiety. Enough times she has been exposed. She's had conversations with people and they've used it against her or she's done something and all the magazines are talking about it or she's done nothing and all the magazines are talking about it. So she was beginning to struggle with debilitating social anxiety and she just was beginning to really lose any joy in any amount, any group of people. She could go on stage and perform for thousands, but when it came to going backstage and talking to one or two people, like terrifying, mortifying. She just felt so certain that she was going to do or say something that was going to embarrass herself. And she just wanted to escape, go to the bathroom and sneak out of that place. And people were like, that's so weird, Brittany, that you can perform for thousands, but you can't seem to talk to people. It's not weird at all. She had a personality that she hid behind when she was on stage. She didn't have to be her. And what anybody wanted to judge that she did on stage, they're not really judging her. They're judging that character she plays. And so whatever, you know, um, but she says that at that time, the other thing that was just crushing was that Justin was getting so much positive publicity and he was on the cover of all the magazines and he was on covers of magazines and Christina Aguilera was on covers of magazines and she says that there was one cover that they were on together in Rolling Stone. He's in this black tank top. He's like staring at her directly with sexy eyes and she's staring right at the camera. I cannot even understand what that look was she was going with. Anyway, in that article, she's just talking about the whole Britney and Justin thing like, yeah, I think they'll get back together again. I hope they do. And just talking about it with so much familiarity. And the truth is, Christina knew Britney, just, I mean, all of them had come up together in the Mickey Mouse Club. And even though she wasn't saying anything cutting, for Britney, it felt like, stop talking about me. Like, this is my business. Please just leave it alone. I know you're not trying to be cruel or you, I'm going to assume you're not trying to be cruel. But it just feels like I don't want salt rubbed in this wound. Can we not talk about my breakup? Can, can you just not make that a topic of your conversation in this interview? Like maybe you can just talk about you and you can leave me to talk about myself when I'm ready. Well, part of her disappearing act at this time, because she was going out and performing, but like in her personal life, just wanting to disappear, crawl in a hole and never come back out. She'd gotten an apartment in New York City. It was this an incredible four story apartment that used to belong to share. It had this terrace that you you know looked over the city. You could see the Empire State Building. It had this fireplace I and mean, it was super, super fancy. But she says that she never went out of the place. I mean, she holed up in there and she just never darkened the doorstep if she could help it. She said something happened to her though at this time when she had that apartment that felt like a picture of her whole life at that time. She said, at one point I realized I had somehow lost the key to the apartment. I was arguably the biggest star on earth and I didn't even have a key to my own apartment. What an idiot. I was stuck both emotionally and physically without a key. I couldn't go anywhere. I also wasn't willing to communicate with anyone. I had nothing to say, but trust it. I always have the key to my apartment these days. And I think that's a really interesting sort of uh, picture of what was going on. Yes, she is, she is stuck emotionally and physically without a key. And there seems to be nobody willing to step in and actually help and guide her. Um, she says, she, she just paints this picture of herself that is so depressing that just reading it just like uh, gives me like the, the saddest, creepiest, loneliest feeling. That there she is in New York City by herself. One time a cousin invites her to go out. She falls on the charity of this cousin. The cousin takes her out to this underground nightclub with low ceilings and red walls. She's in this, you know, 129 baby dress. She's got high heels on and, you know, she ends up smoking pot at the party and, 
you know, she's, she never smoked weed before in her life. And so she's just sort of like woozy and she ends up leaving the party and walking home by herself, breaks a heel on the way home, staggers home and goes out to the terrace and just looks at the stars for hours and hours by herself. And it's like this picture of somebody who's just eating takeout for every meal, you know, going to underground clubs with a cousin, you know, the biggest star on earth. And she just seems to have nobody, nothing to come home to, nothing to look forward to, no friends, no social community, just kind of meandering in and out of her own life. Gosh, that sounds so depressing. Well, who should decide to prey on her in her time of need, but Madonna comes swooping in in all of her glory. And you know, this is what I think about Madonna. I think Madonna is an incredibly jealous person. I think that she sees young people coming up and having a rise in popularity where she once was the reigning queen. And I think she wanted to come and let Britney know I'm still the queen around here. You might be the you know latest young thing, but I'm here and look at all my star power. Look at who I am. I can't figure out why she showed up other than just to have a power play um, in the world of pop entertainment. So she comes to Britney's house and immediately Britney says she walks into the room and of course, Madonna owned the room. She says, I remember thinking it's Madonna's room now. Madonna walks into Britney's house and has such a vibe about her that she takes over the place. And she watch, you know, marches over to the window and is like, hmm, quite a view you have here. And Britney's like, yeah, I guess that's okay. And, you know, Madonna acts in some ways like she's sort of here to be sort of this like older maternal presence who can help guide her through life and give her some pointers about how to make this a successful venture. But what it really feels like to me is just her letting Britney know her place in the hierarchy of pop stars. She said that, you know, Britney gives her all this credit and is like, yeah, I think she probably had some intuitive sense what I was going through and I needed a little guidance at the time and that I was confused about my life and she tried to mentor me. But that's interesting that Britney would say she tried to mentor me, not that she was a mentor to me. Because it just seems like a really unsuccessful partnership here. Other than Britney ends up looking at Madonna as a possible role model, but in all of the worst ways. Also, at one point, Madonna did a red string ceremony with Britney to initiate her into Kabbalah. And she gave Britney a trunk of Zohar books to pray with. Then Brittany at the base of her neck ends up getting this Hebrew tattoo that is one of the 72 names of God that means healing, supposedly. And I just, the whole thing is just so uh, shallow. Like, uh, you know, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to be a mentor to you and I'm going to show you the ways of the world. And while we're at it, let me tie this red string around your arm and give you sort of like the sense that I have some spiritual wisdom as well as some career advice for you. And it's all just so baseless and lame. I mean, is there anybody who looks at Kabbalah as a legitimate religion? You know, it's just sort of the, it was just the trendy thing all the stars were doing at the moment. And I just feel like the whole thing lacks any kind of genuine concern for Britney. I feel like it's so Madonna just trying to make sure that Britney knows her place. And the thing is, is that Britney is meek and mild mannered enough that I don't think that she ever needed Madonna to remind her that I was here first, you know? She says that in many ways, Madonna did have a good effect on me. She told me that I should be sure to take care of my soul and I tried to do that. <clears throat> She modeled a type of strength that I needed to see. There are so many different ways to be a woman in the industry. You could get a reputation of being a diva. You could be professional or you could be nice. I'd always tried so hard to please and to please my parents, to please audiences, to please everyone. I must have learned that helplessness from my mom. I saw the way my sister and my dad treated her and how she just took it. I wish I'd had more of a mentor than to be a badass bitch for me so that I could have learned how to do that sooner. If I could go back now, I would try to become my own parent, my own partner, my own advocate the way I knew Madonna did. She had endured so much sexism and bullying from the public and the industry and had been shamed for her sexuality so many times, but she always overcame it. Well, I don't know if Madonna overcame it because how can you overcome a thing that you are the one who put yourself there in the first place? Like Madonna comes out with a book all about sex and then she's all like, can you believe that I've been objectified like this? And it's like, uh, yeah, I can, because you're the one who gave us all the idea. 
what is up with these people who strip down to nothing? Then when people notice, they're like, how dare you look at me? Look away, cast your eyes away. Well, then don't take your clothes off if you don't want people to notice you. And there's just such a plethora of people right now coming out, people from the 90s and stuff being like, I can't believe the way the industry treated me back then. It was dark days in the 90s. And it's like, uh, well, you kind of had something to do with it. You're aware of that, right? Anyway, uh, to continue on, um, she says that she looked at Madonna and she thought, okay, I just need to be like her because she doesn't care what anybody thinks. And I'm over here writing thank you notes to everybody that I come in contact with to the chef, to the secretaries, to the bartender, everybody gets a thank you note from me. And that's not the sort of thing Madonna would do. So maybe I just need to shake that off. And I'm like, oh no, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't look at kindness as a weakness. And that's what I'm saying. Brittany has no idea how to have power and how to be kind. I mean, she'll say that. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying a revelation that she clearly hadn't thought of on her own. But what I'm saying is, it's so sad to see what she does and calls it, this is me taking my power back um, and thinking that she has to leave off with the niceness in order to be a powerful person. Hardly. Kindness is almost one of the best ways to be powerful. Not that we should try to manipulate the world to become these powerful per people and manipulate kindness as a way to cast the wool over people's eyes. I'm not saying that. I just, I think that there's nothing wrong with writing a thank you note and for her to demonize that part of her personality and look over at Madonna who would waste an enormous amount of people's time just because she could. You know, please, Brittany, find somebody who can show you how to do life where you're not su you're not substituting viciousness as uh, courage, you know? Anyway, as she looked on at Madonna, she decided that she needed to act powerful like Madonna. But then she totally misses the mark and just goes real weird with it in order to gain some kind of power. They were supposed to perform together at the VMAs and they had practiced for a long time doing like this air kiss to each other. But then two hours before it actually happened, Brittany, you know, gets it into her little head that she needs to act more powerful. She's got to show everybody who she really is. And so she decides that she's just going to go for it and actually kisses Madonna. And a lot was made of the kiss, and she said it wasn't anything other than her just trying to gain some of that attention back that she had got the last time she performed. Remember when she rips off her clothes and she's in this like sparkly nude suit, a sparkly little bikini top, sparkly tight pants, and they're nude color, and it's you know it's it's quite the look. But she says a lot of a lot was made out of it, but she was just trying to regain some of that awe in her performance, and just she was trying to feel powerful again, and she was tired of feeling like she couldn't get ahead, and so that's what she chose to do. Um, while they were working to collaborate at the VMAs, she got this idea that maybe she could get Madonna to help her on this other song on her album that she really wanted to get more attention. She said that she really loved the song Me Against the Music on her current album at the time, and that the record company really wanted her to push I'm a Slave for You. But that wasn't the song that she loved. And so she decided like maybe they could create some kind of feature around that song and then maybe it could be pushed to po into popularity. Um, and her idea was maybe I can get Madonna to work on that song with me on the album and then create like a movement around that song and maybe that'll be something. So she went to Madonna directly and asked Madonna for help and Madonna was like, okay, I will. Um, and the reason that I'm even bothering to tell you this story, because it's, you know, on the face sort of dull, is that while they were working on the music video for that song, Madonna said that she had a seam that had come out of her suit. They were just about to start filming, but she said there was a seam on her suit that had come undone and she needed a seamstress to come fix it. So Brittany says that she wound up having to sit in her trailer for hours waiting for the suit to be fixed. Really? I thought, I didn't even know taking so much time for oneself was an option. If I broke a heel on my shoe, I would never make production take the five minutes to let me fix it. I would do whatever the director told me to do, even if I had to hobble onto the set without a heel, even if I had to show up barefoot. During our shoot together, I was in awe of the ways Madonna would not compromise her vision. She kept the focus on her. Going along with Madonna's ideas and being on her time for days was what it meant to collaborate with her. It was an important lesson for me one that would take a long time for me to absorb. She demanded power, and so she got power. She was the center of attention because she made that the condition of her showing up, anywhere. 
She made that life for herself. I hoped I could find ways to do that while preserving the part of my nice girl identity that I wanted to keep. No, no, there's no way to preserve that. If you are going to make everybody wait around for you just because, you're gonna hold everybody hostage just because, because everyone has to understand how important you are, you cannot do that and still maintain this nice girl persona. Like it doesn't exist. You, you, you can't do that because a nice girl would never make everybody wait. And this is what I was thinking as I was reading this part of the book. I kept thinking, is this an example of her actually looking at Madonna and being like, that's a way to be? Or is this her throwing shade at Madonna, but acting like she's complimenting her? I don't know. Um, because this to me doesn't seem like anything anybody could look at and be like, that's a way to be. But then at the same time, I also have to remember that Brittany is so desperately in need of somebody to show her how to go through life with strength and with, and, and she's so tired of feeling so put down all the time that she might have looked at Madonna and thought, now that's a way to make sure people don't walk all over you. Maybe I should try that on. You know, so I genuinely think that she is complimenting Madonna here, but to me, I just, this doesn't make Madonna look very good. Okay, let's continue on chapter 17. She says that her career was going well, but that she in her personal life was losing control of the things that she had once had some control over. It started out one day where she's at her apartment and then who should come busting into the door but four people, four men, three of whom she'd never even seen before. And the fourth, oh, who could it be? Father, have you returned? You know, we have not heard not one word about Jamie since the very beginning of the book. We haven't heard hide nor hair of him ever since her career started. Suddenly he comes busting up with three strangers. They slap her onto the couch and they're like, all right, let's ask you some questions. And they bombard her with questions on and on and on with no reason given as to why they're asking or why she has to give them these answers. You know, and never at any point does she feel that she has the right to say, okay, this is my house, you need to leave. You know, because her dad's involved and I think she feels very submissive to her dad, particularly because of the culture she grew up in. You don't back talk your dad, you just do what he says. And because she is his perpetual child, it wouldn't have even occurred to her to tell him, I'm, I don't like this, I don't even know who these people are, you guys can leave. So she sits and takes it. The very next day, she gets a call from her team and they're like, you're gonna have an interview with Diane Sawyer. Okay, well, Diane Sawyer shows up in her home to do a tour of her house and sit on her couch and berate her for 40 minutes. And she wasn't given any preparation about what the questions were gonna be. It's, a, it is one of the meanest interviews I've ever seen in my life. I had not recalled ever seeing it at the time when it aired. And so rewatching it now in its entirety after I had read this chapter, I was blown away. Like I wanna do an episode just on that interview just because it was so wrong. And here's the thing, I, you know, there's a lot of people who say journalism is terrible right now. You know, you can't t trust journalists, they're just terrible. And by and large, I would say, wow, we have really lost a skill in, you know, digging for a story and giving people objective journalism. But what Diane Sawyer was not like some kind of old school journalism that was just real hard hitting and people aren't willing to do that and everybody's softballing all the celebrities all the time and giving them all the easy questions. What she did was targeted, attacking and bullying. And none of those questions were asked with any genuine desire to get an answer. All of those questions were asked and Diane Sawyer thought she already knew the answer. She just wanted to expose Brittany as some kind of um, twisted, like, messed up, stupid young thing. And I don't know why anybody would want to do that. Like, why would you want to just set somebody up to look like a fool? You know, and, and it's not, and especially like, it's not like Brittany had ever done anything to Diane Sawyer. It's so weird. It's like, it's like Diane Sawyer went in already angry about some kind of previous beef that they'd had, which they hadn't, but that's how mean it seems. It, it just seems like she wants to make Brittany look stupid and she comes with evidence. And some of the questions she asked were wild. It was like, so Brittany, if I looked in your fridge right now, would I find hot dogs and mayonnaise? And Brittany's like, yeah, and Pop-Tarts. You know, it's like, she's so uh, um, gracious in that entire interview. She never seems to get, I mean, she never gets sassy. She never gets bitchy. She, even though it's like the whole time you're like, rise up, Brittany, this lady's crazy. But she's so gracious and she comes off 
very well in that interview, whereas Diane Sawyer just looks like she's just this hammer, just hammering Britney for no conceivable reason. I, I'm not against a, a, an interviewer asking some tough questions. If a celebrity agrees to an interview, although I would say that arguably, I don't really feel like Britney got a choice here, but say like that, you know, if a celebrity agrees to an interview, okay, ask them some hard questions. That's one of everybody's big grievances when Oprah sat down with Harry and Meghan and didn't ask them anything hard. You know, she just sat there and sympathized with everything. Well, that's not what you want either. But so you, you don't want that, but you also don't just want the, the interviewer to seem like this horrific bully. You know, what about these clothes you wore? You know, does anybody ever help you with any of your outfits? Are you ashamed of this? Is there nothing you're ashamed of? Brittany's like, no, I feel pretty good about everything I've done. And Diane Sawyer's like, what about this? And she picks up, you know, she pulls out this picture of Brittany in panties and like, you know, some pearls or something. And, you know, what about this? Can you stand behind this? And, I, you know, just continually, you're just like, whoa, like back off. Like, why are you so mean? But the worst thing that happened in that interview was when she said to Brittany, well, have you heard that the wife of the New Jersey governor said that she wishes she could shoot you? What do you think about that? Brittany's like, whoa, that's really mean. And Diane Sawyer's like, yeah, but you know why she said that? It's because you're such a bad role model. And it just makes it hard for people because you're so out of control. And what are they supposed to do about their kids? So that's why she said she wanted to shoot you. And, and defends the woman's statement. And Brittany's like, that's oh, still pretty bad. And Diane Sawyer's like, what else can, how else can people react to you? I mean, the whole thing is so condescending, so rude. And like I said, she came in not really caring what Brittany's answers were. She just wanted to hurt Britney and then asking like, so Justin keeps saying that you did something wrong. He's saying that you hurt him. Why did you hurt him? How did you hurt him? Like, how is that your business, you old dried up lady? Like, what is wrong with you? Why are you being so hateful? For no reason. I wish she would have asked Britney some hard questions, but with grace and, and with a desire to hear what Britney's side actually was. Like, you know, if they're going to do the interview, okay, do the interview, but it, it was it was it felt like an ambush it felt like she was coming in to shame britney and to make britney feel bad for everything she'd ever done and you know i i won't support everything britney did i do think i think britney was many times way over sexualized i think that she should have had more respect for herself than to constantly put herself in these situations in which she was just being objectified i think that she was worth more than that but i don't think she knew she was worth more than that and is there going to ever be any come up in any conversation with an industry that wants to put young 15 year old girls out there like that. Brittany, I heard it was your idea to put on that Catholic schoolgirl uniform and dance like that in your first video. Is that true? Why would you do that? Uh, why, why, why was the industry letting her do that if it's such a horrible thing? Why were they letting the 15 year old make the decisions? Is anybody gonna ask Diane Sawyer that? No, it's just the grossest interview. And I would love for Diane Sawyer to come out and defend herself and explain to us why she thought that that was an appropriate way to be. All right, so that was the interview. And of course it left Brittany feeling so defeated and vulnerable. She says the interview was a breaking point for me internally. A switch had been flipped. I felt something dark come over my body. I felt myself turning almost like a werewolf into a bad person. I honestly feel that moment in my life should have been a time for growing and not sharing everything with the world. It would have been the better way to heal, but I had no choice. It seemed like nobody really cared how I felt. So the floundering continues, right? So she comes off of that interview where she was just publicly humiliated. At one point she starts crying, asks them to turn off the camera. They turn it off, but not before they get, you know, the shot of her face crumpling in tears. Um, yeah, it was a weird time. Ew, I'm embarrassed. Can we And I'm sure she wasn't crying just because they were talking about Justin. I mean, I'm sure she was crying because she felt attacked that entire interview. Um, she says that back home in Louisiana, it was time for the holidays and she'd gone home and she brought a group of friends with her. They were all in the back uh, hanging out at the guest house where that she'd had built behind the main house. And by the way, this isn't like some little, you know, kind of better house than the one she'd had. This is like a multi-million dollar mansion she'd had built from the ground up for her mom on this sprawling piece of property you know so she but she and her friends are hanging out in the guest house but you know lynn can't handle it lynn comes out why are y'all being so loud y'all gotta hush it's nap time and so it suddenly hit her that she didn't need to stay in louisiana she had enough money to book flights for her and her friends had go to las vegas and party which they did 
She says, uh, we cut loose at the Palms Casino Resort and drink a lot. She said, I'll admit that we got phenomenally stupid. I will also say that this was one time when I almost felt overwhelmed having that much freedom in Sin City. I was the little girl who'd worked so much and then all of a sudden the schedule was blank for a few days and so hello alcohol. Again, referring to herself as I was this little girl. Well, not really, not at this point. You're like 21, 22, you know? When are you gonna stop looking at yourself as a child and start looking at yourself as a woman? And part of this continual need to express how I was so young and innocent just feels like a cop out. Like, well, you're not though anymore. You've been in the industry for years. Like, how is it that you're still so unseasoned? You know, you've had to act as an adult for years and years and years and years and years. And to constantly fall back on the whole, I was just so innocent. I didn't mean any of it. It just kind of happened. I just, you know, I, there I was just trying to have some good times. You know, my motivation was pure. Well, I'm sure her motivation, I'm sure her motivation was pure, but there are consequences to how you behave. And maybe your idea of fun isn't necessarily everybody else's idea of fun in the room who is not drunk and, you know, completely and totally shit-faced, you know? She said Paris Hilton showed up at the casino to hang out and have some drinks. And before she knew it, we got on top of tables. We took our shoes off. We were running through the whole club like fairy dusted idiots. No one got hurt and I had the best time with Paris. We were just playing and we still do every time we get together. I wasn't rude to anybody. It was just innocent fun. And now you can't do anything like that because people whip their phones out. But back then, that time in Vegas, we just acted silly. Having already been under so much media scrutiny, I wasn't interested in causing trouble. It was about feeling free and enjoying what I had been working so hard to achieve. See, I just, I don't know. I just, I, I can't really just get behind this constant excuse making up. I wasn't rude to anybody, it was just fun. I mean, yeah, but that's like what children do. I mean, children run through the place, but like, do you, do I want to be sitting at a table and have somebody run across my table without their shoes on? And just being like, I'm just having fun. It's just very dusted fun and innocence. It's like, yeah, but this is just socially unacceptable. And I'm sure you're not trying to be rude, but it is rude to act like that in public because other people are trying to carry on life. And then you're just, you know, this rowdy, jostling, drunk, sloppy, and, you know, acting a fool. Yeah, I, I, I believe you're not trying to hurt anybody, but also not a way to go through the world. She continues on. Uh, she decides to tell us about the 55 hour marriage that she had. And she describes it as just one of those goofy things you do when you're in Las Vegas in a, you know, a 20 something. I don't know who was in her ear telling her that this is the way that you behave as a young person, that you're given the right to do whatever you want, however you want it and whatever, and just sort of chalk it up to like, I was just young. Because I do think that there is plenty of leeway that can be given for people when they make foolish decisions, trying to do the right thing. But I just feel like she's making foolish decisions with no goal in mind, other than I'm just trying to have a good time. But just trying to have a good time is just, can just sometimes so infringe on the rights of others. Anyway, in her mind, it was time to go and have fun in Las Vegas. And part of one of those things you do is like, just decide to get married to your old best friend. She said she had a childhood best friend that was with her and they'd been hanging out for days. And of course, like you do, you end up like sleeping together. <laughs> Isn't that funny how that happens? And she said that they had stayed up late making poor decision after poor decision. The first one being watching Mona Lisa smile followed by Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then uh, as the decision tree continued to unravel, they decided that they would go to a little white chapel at 3.30 in the morning and get married. When they got there, there was another couple also making poor decisions in Las Vegas. So they had to wait their turn. She says, to be clear, my friend and I were not in love. I was just honestly very drunk, probably in more general sense at that time in my life, I was very bored. She doesn't even remember what happened that night and that her family, upon hearing that she had gotten married, flew out to Las Vegas the next day and were outraged, devastated, and unwilling that she should not bear the full brunt and consequences of what she had done. They really ground her face into that mistake. They were aghast. She said her whole family flew out. They showed up and stared at me with these eyes of such fury. I looked around. What happened last night? I asked, did I kill someone? You got married, they said, as if that might be somehow worse. We were just having fun, I said, but my mom and dad took it so seriously. We have to get this annulled. And they made it such a big deal. And again, Brittany wants to let you know, it was all innocent fun. It's just innocence. But Brittany, are you that innocent? Everybody had a different perspective on it. 
But she said she didn't take it that seriously. She, she said, I thought a goof around Vegas wedding was something people might do as a joke. And then my family came and acted like I'd started World War III. I cried the whole rest of the time I was in Las Vegas. I'm guilty, I said. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have gotten married. She said they went ahead, signed all the documents they had to sign, and the marriage lasted 55 hours. She said, I thought it was strange they got so involved so quickly and so decisively without my even having time to quite regret what I'd done. It wasn't that I wanted to start a family with this guy. And yet what happened was that my parents interrogated me so much about it that part of me almost said, hey, well, maybe I do want to be married. Every young person knows what it feels like to want to rebel against your family, especially if they're controlling. But Brittany says that she had a theory then and she sticks to it as to why they suddenly showed up. She said, they were putting a curious amount of pressure on me about something that I thought was innocuous. And in any case, that was my own business. In fact, my family was so against the wedding that I started to think maybe I'd accidentally committed a brilliant act because I realized something about my being under their control and not having a stronger connection to someone else had become very, very important to them. What do I have over you guys, I wondered. Why would someone else be so huge a threat? Perhaps it's worth mentioning that at this point, I was supporting them all financially. Now, people started to ask her, okay, well, what's next, right? I mean, you, 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 you've, you're you, at the top of your game as far as your career. Seems like you've done all the things there are to do there. You've had this very public breakup with Justin and the tabloids have been very unkind to you. Seems like you're kind of slipping a little in your judgment. You know, what's new for you? What, how can we kind of, how are you going to pull yourself out of this slump? What are you going to do? And her mind was set on, I'm going to get married and I'm going to have a family. That's how I'm going to pull myself together. But first they had to go on tour. She said, we hit the road again. That was already one of the darkest times of my life. And the vibe of the tour was dark too. A lot of sweaty numbers, dark themes and moody lighting. The tour also marked a change in my relationship with my brother, Brian. So she starts to develop this resentment for her brother, Brian, who was living high off the hog and the, off the sweat of her labor. You know, he is sort of helping, you know, he, he's given himself a position and a job and a fat check. And he did sort of hammer out some deals with her and Elizabeth Arden. But he's just relaxing in Los Angeles and New York as she's going on this grueling tour to line his pockets. And she's starting to just feel like, how is this fair that I work myself to death so that everybody else can just live in the lap of luxury? And yet, like, when, where's my time to just relax? Because everyone keeps being like, faster, Brittany, faster, work harder, work harder. You know, and there's never any time to just sort of have any downtime. And even when she broke up with Justin, everyone was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't sit around and be too sad about it because we got to get you back out there. So she says at the same time that she lost Justin, she lost track of Brian. And it just felt like such a loss because two of the most important men in her life are now no longer part of her life. And both of them had almost had betrayed her in a sense. You know, Justin had overtly betrayed her, but then her, bro her brother too, just, it seemed like he was just using her and using her for what he could get, but he didn't really care about her. She said the tour was so depressing. Along the way, she ends up hurting her knee really badly. She'd injured this knee before, but not so badly that she couldn't go on. And, you know, it just felt like everything was falling apart on this tour. And when she'd hurt her knee, she was just screaming hysterically. And it wasn't even so much just the pain either. It was just the, just the sheer weariness of life. Um, she had to reschedule two dates on the tour because of her knee. But it just felt like she was losing interest, losing steam, losing a de desire to even be there. Um, and then who should show up in her life? Right at the moment when she didn't know what to do next, who should show up but Kevin Federline. Okay. This guy, like I said previously, was the greatest mistake of her entire life. And I'll tell you, when she talked about Justin, she talked about how much they had in common, that they had grown up in the Mickey Mouse Club together, that there was like a shorthand, that they just understood each other, that they were like magnets drawn to each other because of how much they had in common. Um, it seems like their senses of humor were similar, their interests were similar. They both had a competing level of fame, at least. I mean, he wasn't a nobody, she wasn't a nobody. And I would say arguably she was more famous than he was. But I mean, he was he was a pretty standard name and in, in any household as well. People knew who Justin Timberlake was. So there was a match that made sense in a lot of ways, not, not just as in careers, but also just as in who they both were as people. Um, so Kevin Petterline is just a huge question mark why she was with him. And the bar was just so low for any guy that might enter into her life. She just needed somebody who wouldn't act like she was the worst. 
She wanted somebody who wasn't just going to embarrass her. And then she was like, arms wide open, like, I'll love you forever, you know? Well, she says they met at a club and she was sitting at a table that she always used to go to way in the back. And in classic Britney style, right away, she says, from the moment I saw him, there was a connection between us. That's the way she starts out every single story of any guy in this book so far. Right away, there was a connection. Right away, I knew he was the one. Right away, I felt like we must have been related in a previous life. There was just such a vibe between us. It's like constantly right away, I knew. Well, I wish somebody would help her not to know. I, I wish somebody would be there to whisper in her ear and be like, not this one. Because... This is such a poor choice. And the only reason that we get for why she knew he was the one is because that night that they met, they went and hung out in a swimming pool and he held her in the swimming pool. And because he was willing to hold her without seeming like he needed it to go somewhere or pushing her to do more than she wanted to do and just like held her close and helped her to feel protected, then she was like, oh, I'm all in. I'm all in with this one. You know, can I have your babies? Can we get married? Can I love you for the rest of my life? And it's so, it's so tragic. Never once did she say we had so much in common. We liked a lot of the same things. We, we love to talk about this. We like, we had books, movies, politics. No, I mean, nothing in common, not any real substance to this relationship, but he was willing to hold her in a pool. And so that's all that it took for her. She says that it wasn't a sexual thing. It was, it wasn't lust, it was intimate. He would hold me as long as I wanted to be held. Had anyone in my life ever done that before? If so, I couldn't remember when. And was there anything better? Quite frankly, Kevin Federline couldn't have made a better move. I mean, this is a real power move on his part. I don't think he's smart enough to have been this precise in what he did in order to get her attention. I think she'd just so be reft of having had any intimate moments with anybody who didn't want to use an abuser that this spoke volumes to her. And he, I mean, he had it locked in at that point. She says though, that she feels like a lot of women can be as strong as they wanna be and they can play this powerful role. But at the end of the day, after we've done our work and made our money and taken care of everyone else, we want somebody to hold us tight and tell us everything's gonna be okay. She said, I'm sorry, I know that sounds regressive, but I think it's a human impulse. We wanna feel safe and alive and sexy all the time. And that's what Kevin did for me. So I held on to him like there was no tomorrow. That's another repeated phrase. So Brittany has two things she says all the time. Right away, I knew he was the one. And the other thing is, I know, I'm sorry for saying this, but it's like as much as she's willing to come out in this book and like it had for it to be this giant tell all, she's also constantly caveating everything she says with, I'm sorry, honestly, it's just how I feel. You know, even now she isn't strong enough to say, well, this is how I feel and not having to make an apology for it. Now she says at the beginning of the relationship, Kevin was playful. And she said that Kevin just liked her the way she was. As a woman who'd spent so much time trying to live up to society's expectations, being with a man who gave me permission to be exactly who I was felt like a gift. I mean, he's not exactly positioned to judge her in any way. He's in nobody who just, you know, rose up out of a rank of innumerable dancers and happened to catch her attention because he was willing to hold her in a pool without letting it lead to something. And because of his five seconds worth of restraint, now he's got her in his back pocket. Um, what, is he going to sit there and judge you for anything you do at this point and maybe scare you off? I, I don't even think he probably realized how he had gotten in. How did he fall ass backwards into Britney Spears' lap? But, you know, he's letting you be you because he better, he, he can't judge. What if she starts sniffing around trying to find out a little bit more about Kevin? It would have behooved her to do so, but she didn't bother. She said Kevin had a bad boy image. I don't think it was just an image, Brittany. I think it was straight up. That's who he was. She says, I had no idea when we met that he had a toddler, nor that his ex-girlfriend was eight months pregnant with his second baby. I was clueless. I was living in a bubble and I didn't have a lot of good close friends to confide in and get advice from. I had no idea until after we'd been together for a while and someone told me, you know, he's a baby, right? <laughs> wow, huge blow. Huge blow. And I think for one of two reasons she stuck around. One, he holds her in the swimming pool and he makes her feel seen and loved. She can't let that go. And then two, this was a man who wasn't afraid of having kids. Justin had been afraid of having kids. So if he's had babies with this girl, maybe he will have babies with her and he won't treat her that way. You know, he won't leave her pregnant and with, uh, you know, another infant. He wouldn't do that. He's not that kind of a guy. Surely he, he's not that. It just didn't work out with the other girl. 
you know, so she's over there and the excuse making machine is like working full blast. Well, she said, I, I didn't believe it. But when I asked, he told me it was true. He told me he saw them once a month. Once a month? You see your kids once a month? What do you got going on, Kevin? That you can't see your kids more than once a month. You have kids? I said, you have children? Not only one child, but two children? So a number was done on me, obviously. I had no idea. And how did she not end it then? Because if I was in a relationship with Guy, and then somebody came over and was like, he's got kids, do you know about that? And then I go up to him and I'm like, hey, do you, you've, you've got kids, like one kid, two kids. And I mean, there's another child on the way. And he's like, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. I would be so unwilling to even see this person for another second. I say that, but then I'm like, but I don't have Brittany's background either. Would I be so devastated by this revelation that I would actually do something about it? Or would I just swallow it like I swallowed everything else and think, well, I'll make my peace with it. He wouldn't do that to me. But that's a huge thing not to say. And I got to tell you right now, the fact that the guy's like, I see my kids, I see my child once a month. And then when the next one comes, I'll probably see it also once a month. All I can say is that that alone would be enough to make me run. Now, the fact that he has kids is not necessarily the great crime. The fact is that he had kids and didn't tell me about it, but then to find out that he is this disengaged, I would just be like, man, there's a lot of problems here. Lying, you're not an invested father. I just, I, I just can't see how it is that she kept wanting to stick around. You can't find somebody else to hold you in a pool. Okay, so that spring of 2004, she had to go back to work. She still had a lot of tour dates that she needed to make sure that she met. But she wasn't in the mood to do it, so she decided to fly Kevin out so he could hang out with her because he helped to distract her from how much she hated work. Again, you know, I'm pointing out at Kevin and being like, look at this fat slob, what a loser. You know, all these kids and never nary a word about it. Um, you know, he's just trying to hook his wagon to her star and all this, all true statements. But Brittany also is just using Kevin too to make herself feel better. He made me feel safe and secure. He distracted me from work. I needed him as a bandage. But there's nothing about this relationship that seems like they were equally, it's not like a lot of give and take and like just joy in the other person and friendship and partnership and camaraderie and love and intimacy. It just seems like, you know, you're helping to distract me and you make me excited because you're a celebrity. But where's the found, where, where's the depth to any of this? I mean, I just can't even imagine marrying this person. And this is like, there's so little to this relationship. She says that flying home, they were chatting away and she asked him to marry her. And he said no, but only so that he then could propose. And she almost acts like that was so romantic. I asked him to marry me. And then he said, no, but it's, you know why? It's because he then wanted to ask me. He hadn't even thought about it, Brittany. He hadn't even thought about asking you to marry him. And then once he realized he he is street smart enough to know that you would be bamboozled by this gentleman who had gotten down on one knee for you, even though you're the one that did it first. I mean, it's like, ugh. Brittany is just begging for whatever crumbs anybody will give her off their table. She's so unwilling to expect anybody to, to treat her well and right. She said that they filmed this diary series together. The original concept was a documentary like Madonna's Truth or Dare, but it became more like a collection of our home movies, especially after I got hurt again. And it was released and it was later released as a reality show called Brittany and Kevin. Chaotic. That would actually be sort of interesting to watch now in light of everything. She said the Onyx Hotel tour was just rough. It was too sexual. It was too sexual for a start. Justin had embarrassed me publicly, so my rebuttal on stage was to kind of go there a little bit too. But it was absolutely horrible. I hated it in the moment. In fact, I hated that entire stupid tour so much that I prayed every night. I said, God, just make me break my arm, make my leg break. Can you make something break? And then on July 8, 2004, with still two months of shows to go, I fell again on the set of my video for Outrageous, got another knee injury, and had to have surgery. The rest of our tour dates were scrapped. I thought back on how much I suffered as a teenager doing physical therapy for my knee. The experience had been excruciating. I had to move my legs up and down, even as they were causing me unspeakable agony. So when the doctors offered me Vicodin, I took it. 
I didn't want to experience that level of pain again. Again, so we were on Prozac. Now we're taking Vicodin. She never brings Vicodin up, up again. Um, she's going to talk about how she did take Adderall. But, I, you know, I just don't know about if we're getting the full truth on the drug and alcohol situation here. Because she continually tells us alcohol was not a problem for her. But then she's going to be giving us a lot of conversations about how much she was drinking and partying. So if alcohol is not a problem, then why are you constantly drinking and, you know, being a little sloppy? And, you know, she's just had it so rough. I, I, I'm not looking to condemn her. I just think that there is a bit of an honesty issue here. Now, again, I don't know how much Viking is going to play a part in the way that she acts from here on out. But I think it's interesting that she even brings it up. It's almost like she's asking you to just sort of fill in the blank there. Because I mean, you could talk about your surgery and never even bring up Vicodin. Vicodin isn't exactly a substance that no one's ever heard of and no one's ever been prescribed. It's pretty typical for a knee surgery, for any surgery to get prescription pain meds. Um, so it's not, I feel like the reason that she brought it up is to let you know, and that's kind of been a problem, but that's where it started. Anyway, she said she went back to her apartment in Manhattan and got into her princess bed. And if anyone wanted to talk to me during this time, I said, leave me alone. No, I don't want to do anything or see anyone. She said that this was a season in her life when she just started getting a little bit argumentative with people. And she wasn't looking to just be sweet little Brittany anymore. She was tired of being pushed around. She said, I felt like I'd been manipulated into going straight back to work after the breakup with Justin because it was all I knew. The Onyx tour was a mistake, but in my mind, I thought I should just do what I was supposed to do, which was work. I realize now that I should have just sat back and taken my time getting over the breakup with Justin before I resumed touring. The music industry is just too hardcore and unforgiving. You often visit a different city every day. There's no consistency. It's not possible to find stillness. And when you're, when you're on the road, when I made the Britney Spears live and more video special in Hawaii in 2000, I began to realize that TV is really easy. TV is a luxury part of the business. Touring is not. Now at about this time, little sister Jamie Lynn has gone on Nickelodeon. She's trying to become her own little star herself. It was a huge role. And Brittany said that she watched her sister having this little life in the cozy world of children's television and thinking, I wish I could have had more of that. Back in the Mickey Mouse Club days, that was where it was at. And just feeling exhausted and worn out. And she's only like 22 or 23, but just feeling so used up and so used by everybody. Desperate for some kind of stability. She says, I thought Kevin would give me the stability I was craving and the freedom too. But to that I say, with his two secret kids, I mean, I'm gonna give you a heads up right now. Stability is not this man's forte. How is he gonna provide stability? He couldn't even provide the truth. Well, she says a lot, of, she says not a lot of people were happy for Kevin and me. Whether or not I liked it, I was one of the biggest stars in the world at the time. He was living a more private life. I had to defend our relationship to everyone. Kevin and I got married that fall. We held a special surprise ceremony in September, but the lawyers needed more time with the prenup so the legal event didn't take place for a couple weeks. She said People Magazine shot the ceremony and she wore a strapless dress and the bridesmaids wore burgundy. After the ceremony, I changed into a pink sweatsuit that read Mrs. Federline and everybody else put on juicy tracksuits too because we were going to go to a club after to dance all night. She said, now that I was married and thinking about starting a family, I decided to start saying no to things that didn't feel right, like the Onyx tour. I parted ways with my managers. I posted a letter to fans on my website in which I told them I was going to take some time off to enjoy my life. She wrote in that letter, I've actually learned to say no, I wrote, and I meant it. With this newly found freedom, it's like people don't know how to act around me. I'm sorry that my life seems like it was all over the place the past few years. It's probably because it was. I understand now what they mean when they talk about child stars. Going and going and going is all I've ever known since I was 15 years old. Please remember that times are changing and so am I. Brittany writes, I felt so much peace about announcing my intention to control my own life at last. Things are gonna change around here, I thought. And then they did. No. And this is where we get into how life is just plummeting for her. I mean, Kevin Federline brought a level of chaos into her life that she can never have imagined. And I just don't understand 
even from reading this, how things went down so badly. We're getting a lot of details about how bad it was, but like not a lot of details about how did it could get like this? Like, I don't understand this trajectory at all. Maybe you guys can help me piece it together. Now she says that she became pregnant almost instantly. And she said, I love sex and I loved food. Both of those things were absolutely amazing throughout both of my pregnancies. Other than that, I can't say that there was much that brought me any pleasure. I was just so mean. You did not want to hear from me those whole two years. I did not want to be around almost anyone at all. I was hateful. I didn't want anyone, not even my mom, to come near me. I was a real mama bear, America's sweetheart, and the meanest woman alive. I was protective over Jamie Lynn, too. After she complained to me about a co-star of hers on her TV show, I showed up on set to have words with that actress. What I must have looked like hugely pregnant, yelling at a teenage, and I later learned completely innocent, girl, um, and screaming, are you spreading rumors about my sister? And to that young actress, Brittany says, I'm sorry. So she ends up giving birth to this first baby. And this little baby is Sean Preston. He was born September 14th, 2005. She said right away, you could tell he was just a sweet, kind little boy. And then three months later, she found out she was pregnant again. But she was thrilled because now she'd have two boys close in age. And for her, it was like, well, I wanted to start a family. Glad to know that I'm just getting that job done. But she said one of the things that was really getting scary at this time in her life was the paparazzi. They were unmanageable. And now that she had these, you know, one, a one little boy and now she's you know, hugely pregnant again, she was just feeling so scared. She'd always been scared about the paparazzi, but now she's got these two little kids she's trying to protect. And it was scary how much they would, they would just bombard her. You do, you look at tape of that time and it's wild that they could just chase her in the streets like this, chase her into stores, take her picture, like cut her off. Like all those things that Harry and Meghan want you to believe are happening to them, but you've never seen were actually happening to Brittany and her indignation at the paparazzi, I can understand. And why she isn't out there trying to make sure that that is that that job is eradicated from the face of the earth is astounding to me because she's actually a person whose safety has been in jeopardy multiple times. Certainly her, her mental and emotional safety was in jeopardy um, many, many, many times, if not her physical safety as well. She says that day and night, the paparazzi, they were just so aggressive. If I stayed out of the public eye, surely, eventually, I thought the photographers would leave me alone. But whether I was sitting at home or trying to go to a store, photographers found me every day and all day. They were there waiting for me to come out. What no one in the media seemed to realize was that I was hard on myself as it was. I would be wild, but at heart, I was always a people pleaser. Even at my lowest, I cared what people thought. I grew up in the South where manners are so important. I still, to this day, regardless of their age, call men sir and women ma'am. Just on the level of civility, it was incredibly painful to be treated with such disrespect and such disgust. Everything I did with the babies was chronicled. When I drove off to escape the paparazzi with Sean Preston on my lap, that was taken as proof that I was unfit. As I was trying to get out of a building and into a car in New York, pregnant with Jaden James and carrying Sean Preston, I was swarmed by photographers. I was told I had to get into the car on the other side. So I said, oh, and I made my way through another thousand camera shutters and shouts of Brittany, Brittany to get in there. If you watch the video and don't just look at the still photos, you can see that while carrying a cup of water in one hand and my baby in the other arm, my heel turned and I almost went down, but I didn't fall. And in catching myself, I didn't drop either the water or the baby, who, by the way, was completely unfazed. This is why I need a gun, I said to the camera, which probably didn't go over that well. But I was at my wit's end. Oh, they're on the other way. Oh. 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 Come on, guys. Come on. Right, guys, give room, please. Give some room, please. Room, make room. This is why I need a gun. Up, guys, please. Thank you. The magazine seemed to be loving nothing more than a photo that they could run with the headline, Britney Spears got huge. Look, she's not wearing makeup. As if those two things were some kind of a sin. As if gaining weight was something unkind that I'd done to them personally, a betrayal. At what point did I promise to stay 17 for the rest of my life? I know, for real. I had forgotten how fit she was. And going back and looking at all of the old videos and all of this, I'm like, whoa, you know, quite the six pack of abs there. And what's interesting is she had a physique that was very unique to that time. Um, it wasn't like shredded. 
but it was super fit, you know, and there wasn't an inch to pinch and yet she still looked really feminine. And so I just think that she, you know, I mean, and she'd become famous off of that body. And so maybe in some ways people did look at it as a betrayal, like, but I thought you were this person, but she just had two kids. Can we cut the lady some slack? You know, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I think too, you know, as much as she might have wanted to say that it was annoying that everyone was coming after her for her weight, you have to believe that she probably was coming after her own self for her weight. You know, when you've been that itty bitty and you've danced around with hardly any clothes on and there wasn't like even one tiny bit of fat to jiggle. And then, you know, you've gained a little bit of weight. That would have felt, you wouldn't have needed anybody to point that out to you. You're well aware that you don't look like you did in your prime. And so it has just been really painful to ha be like, you know, you're, you're hoping no one's noticed that you've gained weight. But then, of course, everyone does. I mean, that would just be so humiliating. That was a weird time in media where people could just go after everybody for their weight and act like they were justified in doing it. When John Preston was very little, Kevin started working harder on his own music. Oh, you guys, this is chapter 20. And Kevin is just like Kevin's already the worst on every level. But now it's like, I didn't even think he could up his game in being the worst, but he has. He wanted to make his own name, which was something I encouraged. He was recording a lot, which was his passion. She said sometimes she'd drop by the studio and it was very clear that she was not invited to hang around. She said she could smell weed wafting out of the studio door before she even walked in. He and the other guys would all be getting high and it felt like I was in the way and I wasn't invited to their party. And she said she just couldn't even stand the smell of pot smoke. It just nauseated her. And she had a little baby with her and she was pregnant. I mean, she, okay, y'all don't want to be hanging out. Well, I don't really want to hang out either, so I won't. But here he is all the day, always away from her, always smoking weed, always pretending like he's working on his music career, but he isn't. He's just partying and leaving her with the two kids in the exact same scenario that he left his ex-girlfriend. She said that at that time they had hired an amazing chef, but he was really expensive, so they couldn't use him that often. But one time she was eating something the chef had cooked and she said, oh my God, this is the most delicious thing I've ever had. Can you just live with us? I love you so much. And she meant it. She did love him because she was so grateful to finally get some freaking help around there. You know, she's got, she's hugely pregnant. She's got a baby and the daddy is nowhere to be seen, you know? And so she's just got a love on the staff that she's able to, to get. The way she held herself up during those days when I think you or I would have just been completely debilitated was to continue to live in the fantasy that this guy didn't mean it. Excuse, excuse, excuse. She says, maybe this is the way married couples are, I thought, as Kevin and I grew more and more estranged. You take turns letting each other be a little selfish. This is his first taste of fame for himself and I should let him have it. I gave myself pep talks. He's my husband. I'm supposed to respect him, accept him on a deeper level than I'd accept anyone I was just dating. He's the father of my kids. His demeanor is different now, but if it changed, it could change back. People say he's going to break up with me while I have tiny children like he did with the mother of his first two children when they were infants, but no way. How he was with his other family won't be the way he is with me. <laughs> the eternal lie we all tell ourselves. Yeah, uh, well, he's shown himself to be a loser. He didn't suddenly not become a loser when he met you. She says, of course, she was lying to herself, totally in denial that he was going to leave her. He wasn't around at all. He was going off and doing his own thing. It's not even like they were living in the same house. He was traveling around supposedly for his career. And at one point she's like, all right, enough of this. And he was in New York. So she flew to see him. She's like, we've got to spend some time together. How can we call ourselves a family if this is how it's going to be? So she checked into a nice hotel, excited to see him, but he wouldn't even see her. He wouldn't even see her. And the manager that he had, who had previously worked on her team, wouldn't see her either or arrange for, for them to have a meetup. But this is what's wild to me. There's no reason given for why he's acting like this. He can't say, hey, Brittany, you're off the deep end. I don't like who you've become. I don't know, you know, I can name X, Y, and Z that you did. It's just you're an unsafe person. None of that. It's just always shutting her out, always shutting her out, always shutting her out. And I don't get that. I don't understand how suddenly this manager who had one time worked for Britney Spears is suddenly taking sides with Kevin Federline and is like, I'm gonna protect my new client. Why was he even on Team Federline at all? Because that joker was never gonna have a career. The fact that he really thought he was a rapper, I mean, that is the funniest joke I've heard in a while. But I, this is why I feel like I'm not getting the full story. 
How could anybody behave this way? She hadn't done anything. There's a lot of degrading stories about her where she's like, oh, she's fat. She doesn't have makeup on. But like, that's not exactly a reason not to see your wife. She said, all I could think was that I wanted to get close enough to Kevin that I could ask what was going on. I wanted to say, when you left to come out here, we hugged. You kissed me. What's going on? What happened? I had suspected something was up, that he was changing, especially once he started getting pressed and feeling himself. One time he came home late and he told me that he'd been at a party. Justin Timberlake was there, he said, and Lin Lindsay Lohan was too. What are you going to like show up at your wife's door she wake her up out of a sound sleep to say, hey, I just hung out with your ex-boyfriend at this party, you know, and act like it was like this really exciting thing. I mean, it's so lame. It's so lame that he'd be impressed. And that's exactly what Brittany said. Do you think I care about your stupid party? I th Do you have any idea how many parties like that I've gone to? I've known some of those people longer than I've known you. Do you know how much I went through in my years with Justin? No, you know none of it. I didn't say that, but I wanted to say it and a whole lot more. Kevin was just so enthralled with the fame and the power. Again and again in my life, I've seen fame and money ruin people. And I saw it happen to Kevin in slow motion. In my experience, when most people, especially men, get that type of attention, it's all over. They love it too much. And it's not good for them. Some celebrities handle fame well. They have perspective. They have fun being admired. But not too much fun. They know whose opinion to listen to and whose opinion to ignore. Those first two years when you're a celebrity, well, it's a feeling you can't explain. I think some people are great at fame. I'm not. My first two or three years, I was good at it and it was fine. But my real self? In school, I was a basketball player. I didn't cheerlead. I didn't want to be out there. I played ball and that's what I loved. But fame? That world isn't real, my friends. It's not real. You go along with it because, of course, it's going to pay the family's bills and everything. But for me, there was an essence of real life missing from it. I think that's why I had my babies. So getting awards and fame and all that stuff, I liked it a lot. But there's nothing lasting in it for me. What I love is sweat on the floor during rehearsals or just playing ball and making a shot. I like the work. I like the practicing. That has more authenticity and value than anything else. And she says one of the people that she always looked at as a model for somebody who had successfully navigated fame was Jennifer Lopez. She said she was very good at being famous at indulging people's interest in her but knowing where to draw lines. She always handled herself well. She always carried herself with dignity. I would agree. She's very likable, but she's not a doormat. And I, I just don't think there's very many celebrities who know how to do that very well. Meanwhile, Kevin is one of them who's neither a celebrity nor knows how to handle himself. Kevin didn't know how to do any of that. I'll confess, I'm not great at it either. I'm a nervous person. I run away from most kinds of attention as I've gotten older, maybe because I've been really hurt. But she says at the time of that rough trip to New York, I should have known my marriage was over, but I still thought it might be salvageable. Later, Kevin moved on to another studio and this one in Las Vegas. And so I went there hoping to talk to him. When I found him, he had his head shaved. He was getting ready to shoot the cover of his album. He was in the studio all the time. He really thought he was a rapper now. Bless his heart. Because he did take it so seriously. <laughs> but seriously, this guy is so focused on this career that's never going to happen that he's completely abandoned Britney and the boys. She said that she showed up in Vegas carrying Sean Preston, still pregnant with Jaden James, full of sympathy for Kevin's situation. He was trying to make something happen for himself and everybody seemed to be doubting him. I know what that was like. It's scary to put yourself out there like that. You do really have to believe in yourself even when the world makes you wonder if you have what it takes. But I also felt like he should have been checking in more and should have been spending time with me. Our little family was my heart. I'd had his babies inside of me for a very long time and I'd sacrificed a lot. I'd all but abandoned my career. I'd done everything to make our life possible. So she leaves Sean Preston at the hotel with a nanny very capable. And she shows up on set because she's like, come hell or high water, I'm gonna get this guy to talk to me. You know, he wouldn't talk to me in New York, you wouldn't see me in New York, but I'm gonna show up. I've got an, I've got an infant and I'm literally pregnant with the second child. The guy's got to talk to me and tell me what's going on. So she says she shows up on the video set. But again, she was told that he didn't want to see me. But again, I was told he didn't want to see me. He since said that isn't true, then he never would have done that. All I know is what I experienced. Security guards who'd worked at my home were at the door and they wouldn't let me in. It felt like everyone on that set was shunning me. I peeked through a window and saw a bunch of young people partying. The set had been turned into a nightclub. Kevin and the other actors were smoking weed and looking happy. I felt completely outside of myself. I watched the scene for a while without anyone inside seeing me. And then I said to the security guard, okay, great. I turned around and I went back to the hotel. 
And so she's at the hotel, she's devastated. And then who should poke their head in but one of her brother's old friends, Jason Trawick. And he said he'd heard what happened and he was just wondering how she was doing. Now, she doesn't go on into any greater detail about what happened with that guy. It just said it meant a lot to her that he would ask, but what is he doing waiting in the wings? How did he hear about what happened? You know what? How does she go from the studio back to her to hotel room? She's crying and then Jason shows up and is like, hey, you doing okay? It's like, what are you doing here? You know, just another person preying on Brittany. Chapter 21, I'm gonna kind of skim because there's not that much in here that is very profound, except for the fact that she's ha finally had her second baby um, and she's putting all of her attention into the boys into making her house a home. But she said she was getting kind of like weird about how controlling she was. She didn't want anybody to hold the boys, like even her own mom, she wouldn't let the, her mom hold um, Jaden for like months after he was born and then only for five minute intervals. She just didn't want anybody touching her kids. She was really scared. Every time she'd go out with any kind of paparazzi and they'd put blankets over the baby's heads and things like that, which I don't think that's weird. I mean, the baby doesn't need flashes in his eyes constantly. But just even as she was trying to remodel her home, she insisted that there be white marble everywhere on all of the floors. Take out all the hardwood. I don't want it. I must have white marble. And she was, she says, and gives the impression that she was belligerent about it to the designer. And then even when he was like, ah, uh, that's going to be really hard. If people, if anybody falls on this floor, it's, it's going to create an injury. And she's like, I don't even care. I need, I need the white marble. And so this whole chapter is her talking about how crazy she was um, and a controlling aspect. But I don't really get a whole lot of examples of how out of control she was. Um, I don't know if she's just not able to provide them or if this was a sense that people had given her about who she was then. And so she's regurgitating it back for us because she doesn't really remember how, how she was. She does say that she was really struggling now that she looks back on it with postpartum depression and that that was really making it difficult for her to figure out how to be. Um, but she finishes off the chapter by saying that having her boys infantilized her further and that the whole Benjamin Button syndrome thing that she talked about earlier in the book is continuing to happen and that she'd actually seen this happen when Jamie Lynn was born but that she's seeing it happen more and more now. She says, I think what happened when I first saw my boys after they'd been born was similar to what happened to me after the breakup with Justin. It was a Benjamin Button thing. I aged backward. Honestly, as a new mother, it was as if some part of me became the baby. One part of me was a very demanding grown woman yelling about white marble, while another part of me was suddenly very childlike. Kids are so healing in one way. They make you less judgmental. Here they are so innocent and so dependent on you. You realize everyone was a baby once, so fragile and so helpless. In another way for me, having kids was psychologically very complicated. And it happened when Jamie Lynn was born too. I loved her so much and was so empathic. I loved her so much and was so empathic that I became her in a, this strange way. When she was three, some part of me became three too. This is hearkening back to that whole identity situation. Um, becoming a new identity without meaning to, that same thing that happened when she was playing the part in the movie. She just attaches herself to people and then becomes whatever it is that they are, even if that means becoming kind of childish and babyish. Um, but she says she just wasn't able to get any kind of therapy and that at the time there just wasn't the, the national conversation about healing and therapy that there is now. And so she just sort of didn't know how to handle her sadness and her anxiety and her fatigue. She didn't know how to handle the, the perinatal depression. Um, then that once her babies were born, she just added confusion and obsession about the baby's safety to her long list of other mental issues. And it, everything just kept ratcheting up. And the media was paying way too close attention all the time. So everything she did already would have been problematic in a vacuum, but now with everybody, you know, echoing it back and forth to each other about, look what she did, look what she did, look what she did. It made it even worse and she became even more unable to control the things the way her mind would race and all this because now it's not just me making a mistake quietly in my own home or becoming a little too obsessed about this or the or that but now every time i do something everyone like, screams back to me that was so stupid with kevin away so much no one was around to see me spiral except every paparazzo in america all right 22. she says that when she was pregnant with Jaden, she dyed her hair black Trying to get it blonde again, I turned it purple. I had to go to a beauty salon to have them completely strip my hair and make it a realistic shade of brown. It took forever to get it right. Nearly everything in my life felt like that. 
To say the least, there was some chaos. The breakup with Justin and going on that rough Onyx tour, marrying someone who no one seemed to think was a good match, and then trying to be a good mother inside a marriage that was collapsing in real time. And yet, I always felt so happy and creative in the studio. So at this time, while everything else is just completely out of control, she then decides that, you know, she's gonna keep working. She's not gonna stop working now. So she's got these two little babies that she's taking with her back and forth to the studio. Um, sometimes she would have childcare for them back at the house. Sometimes she'd bring them straight to the studio, but she was going to keep working. She said, I love that no one was overthinking things on this album and that I got to say what I liked and didn't like. I know exactly what I wanted and I love so much of what was offered to me. Coming into the studio and hearing these incredible sounds and getting to put down a vocal on them was fun. Like, it was what was going on outside the studio that was so upsetting. The paparazzis were like an army of zombies trying to get in every second. They tried to scale the walls and take pictures through windows. Trying to enter and exit a building felt like being part of a military operation. It was terrifying. She said, if making Blackout felt good, life was still tearing at me from every different direction. From one minute to the next, everything was so extreme. I needed to have more self-worth and value than I was able to conjure back then. And yet, even though it was very hard time in every other way, artistically it was great. Something about where I was in my head made it, me a better artist. Meanwhile, Kevin was doing a lot of press and you would have thought that he just hit a grand slam in the World Series. I didn't know who he was anymore. When he was asked to do a Super Bowl commercial for Nationwide, it didn't matter that the ad was making fun of him, playing a fast food worker who dreams of being a star. After he got that offer, I basically never saw him. It was like he was too good even to talk to me. He told everyone else that being a father was everything to him, the best thing in his life. You wouldn't know it because the sad truth was he was away a lot. Anyway, this is our last chapter, but she says, when I married Kevin, I meant it with all my heart. If you look into my eyes and my wedding photos, you can see it. I was so in love and so ready for a new phase of my life to start. I wanted babies with this man. I wanted a cozy home. I wanted to grow old with him. I think the thing is, is that she had set her sights on Kevin being something he never could, based solely on the fact that he had made her feel protected one time. Her lawyer told her that Kevin was gonna file for divorce no matter what she did, so she might as well be the first to the punch. I was led to believe that it would be better if I did it first so that I wasn't humiliated. Now, Kevin would like you to believe that he was blindsided by it. Like, he couldn't even believe that she was getting a divorce. Like, wasn't everything fine? You know, and then she just upped and did something that erratic. But that's indicative of who she is. She's an erratic person. But it's like, you're never even there to help her with the kids. You know, nobody knew where you were. Every time that she'd go up to see you, you would deny her entrance into places. The very staff that used to work for her now works for you. The very security guards who used to work for her now work for you and they won't let her in. And then, but, but she's the erratic one. The media attention was crazy. It was probably good for Kevin's album, which came out a week before we announced our divorce, but I was vilified. Some people tried to be supportive, but in the press, they often did this by being cruel toward Kevin, which actually wasn't that helpful. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you can be mean all day long by your own siblings, but let somebody come out on the playground and say boo to your little sister or little brother and suddenly you're ready to go to war. I think that's how she felt. It didn't make her feel better to have people be mean about Kevin because she had still really wanted that to work out. You know, she wasn't gunning for a divorce and excited and rubbing her hands together, you know, finally can throw that man into the gutter where he belongs. She really wanted things to work with him. And so it hurt her when people were unkind about him. She said later that month I presented at the American Music Awards and as I waited to go out on stage, Jimmy Kimmel delivered a monologue and a skit about Kevin, who he called the world's first ever no hit wonder. They sealed a stand in into a crate and put it on a truck and dumped it into the ocean. But this was the father of my two infant sons. I found the violence towards him unsettling. The whole audience was laughing. I hadn't known that was going to happen and it caught me completely off guard. I went out on stage and I gave the award to Mary J. Blige, but I went backstage afterward and tried to make it clear that I had been blindsided and I didn't like it. I also didn't think that in the midst of a custody battle, having my ex-husband treated this way would be any benefit to me. Everyone seemed delighted by the news of our divorce. Everyone except me. I did not feel like celebrating. This is the thing. Brittany was in one of the worst marriages and had she listened to anybody's advice, she might not have found herself in that situation. But I think she was so tired of everybody telling her what to do that she couldn't even hear good advice when it was offered to her. I think that if nobody has a good word for a person that you're dating, at a certain point you have to ask yourself, why is it that I can't find one person who will support this? Can, every, can the world truly be populated by this many naysayers? There has to be a reason why nobody would support it. And it wasn't just because he was a nobody and she was a somebody according to the terms of the world. 
It's because he was a player and a bad boy and had kids that he couldn't care less about and saw only once a month. But he was already ready and willing to hop into a relationship with her. She said, looking back, I think that both Justin and Kevin were very clever. They knew what they were doing and I played right into it. That's the thing about this industry. I never knew how to play the game. I didn't know how to present myself on any level. I was the bad dresser. Hell, I'm still a bad dresser and I admit that. And I work on that, I try. But as much as I'll own my flaws, ultimately know that I'm a good person. I can see now that you have to be smart enough, vicious enough, deliberate enough to play the game and I did not know the game. I was truly innocent, just clueless. I was a newly single mom of two little boys. I didn't have the time to fix my hair before I went into a sea of photographers. So I was young and I made a lot of mistakes. But I will say this, I wasn't manipulative. I was just stupid. And that's one thing Justin and Kevin ruined about me. I used to trust people, but after the breakup with Justin and then my divorce, I never really did trust people again. And to this last passage, I will say, how is it that you can be eight years into this lifestyle and just keep telling me that you're innocent and you didn't know? I didn't know how to play the game. I, I, I had two little boys. How could I fix my hair? You know, I, I think this is the only thing I can think is that because she had grown up really poor and I've heard her say in interviews that she was never the sort of person that even though she had the money, she could walk in and buy a thousand dollar sweater just because, you know, that to her, it felt like that that is a waste of money. Like that sweater shouldn't cost that much. I'm not going to dignify that by purchasing it. And so the only thing I can think is that like she had the money and the means to make life easier for herself, but she felt like she didn't have the authority to spend that money to take care of herself in a way that would have been comfortable for her. Like the fact that she's like, we had a, a chef that we would sometimes hire, but it was really expensive. So we didn't do it all the time. I'm like, Brittany, you had in-house chef money. You could have easily had all the help you wanted, all the nannies you wanted, you know, hair and makeup all the time, chefs. You could have made life really easy for yourself so that you wouldn't have had to feel like you were constantly being attacked by the outside world. You know, but she's literally living like, you know, she'll call her mom and be like, hey, can you watch the kids? And it's like, Brittany, you have enough money to find the best nanny in the entire world. You don't have to rely on your mom to come watch your kids so you can go out for a night with Paris Hilton. You know, but she's still oddly living tethered to the Louisiana life. You know, the fact that her parents could just show up when she had had that, you know, night out in Vegas and she's beholden to them and feels like she owes them an explanation for her behavior, even though she's paying all their bills. And if it weren't for, for her money and for the sweat off her brow, they would all be living, you know, paycheck to paycheck with a spoon and a can of beans. The only reason that they have anything is because of her. And yet they treat her like dirt and she lets them. But she keeps telling herself it's because I didn't know any better. Uh, what, why weren't you just like, okay, I gotta get a manager up in here to help me sort out my household so that, you know, I need a household manager. Bring somebody in here to do my hair regularly. Even the fact that she says she dyed her hair black and then she says as though it was like a weird thing. She's like, then I had to go into a hair salon and they had to strip my hair and that took forever for them to dye it a normal and regular natural shade of brown. Like she shares that as though that were a unique experience, but it's like, well, were you regularly not, I mean, who, who was doing your hair regularly? And I know like maybe this is just like post Kardashian era where we act like everybody in Hollywood has a private jet and a whole team of people that is doing hair and makeup all the time. She had enough money and there was enough people around her who could have suggested resources to her that I don't know why she's always acting like I tried, I tried, I tried. I mean, she's truly acting like she was in a trailer and baby daddy, you know, was out with the gang at the corner bar and she's, you know, dragging her infants in and out of bars looking for daddy. Like that's the story she's painting, but I'm like, you didn't have to live like that. So why did you? Why are you always hiding behind your innocence and your naivete and your, I honestly didn't mean for this to happen persona. I, I got it at first, but now you're too much into adulthood and have had too many life experiences for me to keep buying that and letting you get a pass on that. I respect you too much to let you get a pass on that. So why, what, what in the world was going on with Brittany in this era? And this book doesn't necessarily give us a lot of pictures. It's a lot of, I was so put upon by others. I was so degraded and I was so hurt and I just couldn't find my voice. And I do think there's truth to that. I do think that it would be hard to find your voice. Uh, you know, I just, this is my last thing I'll say, you know, like in the Bible, when Jesus would go to people and he would ask them first, do you want to be healed? And it's almost like, what kind of a question is that? Of course they do, but some people don't. You know, and I think that, did she want to get better? I don't know. Like if somebody were to ask her and say, I could wave a magic wand over your life. Do you want it all to be better? Do you want it to not hurt like this? I don't even know if she would know how to be healthy.
So anyway, that was part three. I hope you guys have a great rest of the week and I hope you had a Merry Christmas. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.